Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is over Luke 19, entitled, Were You There When He Rode Into Jerusalem? Luke 19, and we're going to be taking a break from our normal procedure here at Island Baptist Church, which has been working through the Old Testament for a couple of years, the highlights of the Old Testament, and we're going to uh, jump into the New Testament for the season, uh, for the next coming four Sundays that I'm going to be here. I won't be here for the next two, but the next four Sundays I'm going to be here, we're going to be looking at the final week of Jesus' life. And uh, starting the Sunday with his so-called triumphal entry, that's where we're going to be tonight, uh, this morning in Luke 19. If you look down at verse 28, here's where it starts. The week starts effectively with this uh, entry into Jerusalem. It says, and after Jesus had said these things, he was going on ahead, ascending to Jerusalem, because everywhere from Jerusalem is up, or going toward Jerusalem, you've got to go up, coming from the coast. Coming from the north, coming from the east. He's coming from the east. It's about a 2,500 foot up, if you will, from the Jordan Valley. Came about that when he approached Beth Fodge and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples. Go, here's the instruction go in the village opposite you, in which you are to enter, and you will find a colt tied. Notice he's orchestrating all this, right? So you kind of get the premonition something's about to happen. Okay, yep which no one has yet sat on this colt, untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, thus you shall speak, the Lord has need of it. Would that have worked for you? If it was yours? Who's the Lord, right? I need a, need a name. And it's not a bad question, you know, who is he? And, and he's going to be answering that question, at least in part here. Uh, but we're going to be seeing it. And in fact, it goes just like that. He says, and they went and did it. Those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. So he's orchestrating all this. Putting himself out there. And as they were untying the colt, his owner said, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, And the Lord has need of it. And it worked. Bingo. <laughs> and they brought it to Jesus. They threw their garments on the colt, put Jesus on it. And he was going, and they were spreading their garments in the road. And so it starts off with the twelve, and they're worshiping him, and they're, they're praising him. And, and then now it's going to start expanding. It's going to start spreading among the crowd. And so... Uh, as they were going, spreading their garments, verse 37, he, he, and as he now approached the de, near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which, we, which they had seen. So they're hoping he's Messiah. They're believing he's Messiah. They're believing he's the king. He's doing what a king should do. He's actually fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. We'll see it in a bit. Uh, and so they're thinking, oh, this could be the guy. And so blessed is the king. They start saying, who comes in the name of the Lord and peace on earth, glory in the highest. And other places it says they sang Hosanna, which means uh, God come, God save us. And then some of the Pharisees of the multitude said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They knew that this was the stuff that he, they were saying was actually reserved only for the Messiah. And of course, they didn't think it was him, not the Pharisees. And by the way, the crowd was hoping it was him, but it was, they were hoping on an interpretation of who he was. And let me just say this just as a follow-up to what I said to the kids here. Be careful that you're worshiping Jesus. So we're, of course, we're worshiping Jesus. All we got to do is name his name, and that's Jesus. No, it's not. No, it's not. Don't tell me about your worship services until you tell me about how deep you're going in the Scriptures. Because it's real possible the same crowd that, that shouts Hosanna is crucifying him in four days. So that's exactly what happens. It's only emotionalism if you don't have the real Jesus. And it's real easy to get caught up in emotionalism, and I'm all into worship, and I'm all into praising Him, and we ought to be completely wholehearted in that, but you cannot be in that in truth unless you are in the truth. You got me? Otherwise, you're coming up with your version of Jesus and who you expect it to be, and let me tell you something, that Jesus will fail you. That God will wash out on you and your emotionalism, will you'll, you'll go the other extreme. You're all up, praise Jesus. And then when Jesus doesn't do what you tell him to do, which I found out he doesn't do too well at that, by the way. He just doesn't work well when you tell him to do stuff. When he doesn't do what you tell him to do, then you're going to go the other way. You're going to get all mad at him because he didn't come through. Because Jesus failed me. Jesus didn't come through. No, your Jesus didn't come through. Your Jesus never will. He doesn't exist. Don't talk to me about your worship until you talk to me about your depth and the truth. Because you can only worship that what you know. And if you don't know him, well, you can't worship him, really. 
So these people are a prime example of how emotionalism can just take you down a great road. They're praising him like anybody should have been. Jesus, he weeps, as you're going to see, because he knew they weren't for real. They thought they were. That's the bad thing, isn't it? There's no deception like self-deception. You think you're great. Well, you think that. What does God say? Maybe you should ask him. And so they rebuke him, or they rebuke your disciples. Jesus says, listen, somebody's going to praise me today, effectively. I tell you, if these be silent, the stones will cry out. Did I tell you we're going to Jerusalem? Tomorrow. I'll be in Jerusalem, actually, in 24 hours. And um, don't you want to go? Uh, one, of the big, one of the best souvenirs from over there is a rock from the Mount of Olives because it was one of these rocks that could have cried out, you see. And it's a reminder to me of there's something, there's a voice better than a rock, and that's mine and yours, and our hearts turn to God. If these be silent, the stones will cry out, he says, and they, when they approached and saw the city, he wept over it. We call this, and it may be titled in your Bibles if you have a title on there, the triumphal entry of Jesus. I would suggest to you that's a mistitle. It's not in the original text to begin with. But we call it triumphal. I, I don't see any tri anything triumphal about it. First of all, they have a misconception of who Jesus is. And Jesus doesn't accept their praise. He weeps the whole way. Because he knows what's coming for them. They've missed the day. Even though they're worshiping him on the day that it says he, they should have, because it's predicted in, in the book of Daniel, and in case you haven't, aren't familiar with that prophecy, book of Daniel 9, Daniel 9, I did a sermon series back in the summer on Daniel, and I would recommend to you the, the amazing prophecy sermon that I did there, because it talks about this prophecy that predicts to the day, 483 years in advance, that they should have been waiting for Jesus on this day. And, and, it, it, and Jesus holds them to it. If you had known this day, he says, what day? Not four days later when he's crucified, but the day he rides into Jerusalem, that's the cutoff. Pay attention to what he says. If you had known this day, 24-hour day in which I'm riding into Jerusalem, even you, he says, the things which would bring you peace, but now, notice when? Now, not tomorrow, and not in four days at his crucifixion. That was a precipitous event. This was the event. This was the day they should have been waiting for. They weren't there to wait for him. So, of course, they crucified it. But now it will be hidden from your eyes, for the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side, predicting great uh, devastation for the Jews, and will level you to the ground and your children within you, bad stuff, and they will not leave in you one stone another because you did not recognize the time of your vegetation, which was which day? That day. You missed it. I want you to know something else. They didn't get a second chance. He didn't say, you know what? I'm mad at you guys. So this time tomorrow, if you're not here and your heart's not right, then that's going to be it, right? Because God is always a God of second chances. No, he's not. Mostly he is. He's been almost 100% that in my life. But if you're, if you're riding... If you're riding the sin wave hoping that God will give you a second chance, it may not always come true for you. You just need to know that. He doesn't give them a second chance. This is it, and it is it. And there are times, and I would say most of the times in my experience, in which God gives second chances. And there are times he does not. And, and that is the God of the Bible. So make sure your God is the God of the Bible, not a God that you want him to be, because he's not obligated to keep that for you. Just, just a, word of, a word to the wise, as they say, is sufficient. So we have this story, and now he's coming, and he's holding the candle for this day, so it's such an incredible day, and I want us to step back and consider some of the things of it. And uh, I want to say before I get into this, this sermon series I'm going to be due for the next four Sundays, I want to give credit to a pastor by the name of Mark Adams, and I don't know him, and you probably don't either. But nonetheless, it's based upon his sermon series. I'm going to make sure that he gets, if there's any credit, that it goes to him and ultimately to God. Uh, about 60 years ago, CBS News uh, tried, or CBS tel television station, tried a new format, one of their TV shows. And what they would do is each week they would transform their studio into a time machine in order to take their, their viewing audience back in time to a particular event. And they would restage everything and so that you could experience as if you were there. And... Uh, 
the, the leader of it or the, the head person of it was a guy that you young people won't know, but all of us oldies will know, Walter Cronkite. Anybody know Walter Cronkite? All the oldies, see? Oh, some of you youngies. <laughs> He's been dead for quite a while. He was a news anchor there on uh, CBS. And in 1953, he inaugurated this uh, series on television. It went on for many, many years. The first telecast of this was a reenactment of the tragedy of the Hindenburg, 1937. So they converted all the studio to what it would be like back then. And they brought in reporters as if reporters had been there interviewing the people that had seen in the events. And so the whole idea was to take you back so that you could relive the events and and they would start the process and then he would do some explanation and then he would conclude he would go into the whole uh, dramatic presentation by saying the simple words you were there remember that I want to show you just a clip from that here put it up here Walter Cronkite we're there there you go we're gonna be doing that together Stepping back into time for the next four Sundays together, we're going to be going by a sort of similar format, uh, the last week of Jesus' life. And we're not going to be consulting Walter Conkite. We're going to be result- consulting the eyewitnesses who wrote about Jesus' life. In fact, the four Gospels, as they write about Jesus' life, took a full one-third of their writings in almost every case of the Gospels to write about only seven days of his life. Seven days of life and ministry of Jesus Christ on earth, yep. So it's certainly worth our time to spend four Sundays as we build up toward Easter coming and actually going to take place a day, a day after Passover this year, which is, which is rather unusual. So we're going to be going back and stepping back in time for almost 2,000 years uh, to 33 A.D. Uh, Jesus rises into Jerusalem after he's been on a three-week, uh, three-day ministry across the Jordan Valley, across the Jordan River, He's been baptizing, or his disciples actually have. He's been healing. Uh, He's been teaching. And now he makes his way for the final time of many, many times, no doubt, that he visits Jerusalem. He makes his way for the final time that he's going to be going into Jerusalem. He's going to be crucified for our sins, and he's going to be enduring uh, all the weight of our sins in that process. And so Jesus arrives uh, uh, three days, more or less, uh, ahead of the time that we see him here, he stays in Bethany, it tells us, with his three friends, Lazarus, who he raises from the dead not too long before this, and of course the, his sisters, uh, Mary and Martha, and he stays with them for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, a, is sort of a logistics reason. Uh, the Passover uh, festival time for Jerusalem is high season. There are no places to sleep. So a city that sleeps, say, 50,000 roughly at this time would have been swollen to maybe half a million. So where do you put these people? Well, you rent your couch and you rent your room and you rent your floor and you rent everything. Everybody makes money. We live in a resort area here on, on South Padre Outland. Man, we make a ton of money when all you guys are down for, well, not spring break so much, but other times, summer. Because the smart ones don't rent during this time when they get it trashed. But anyway, uh, it's high rent. Uh, it's, it's high season, and so there was a logistic reason why I didn't go into Jerusalem, because there's no place to stay. So it's very interesting, and, and I'm not sure what the, exactly what this, the implications of this are. But so, so he comes into the world, and there was no room in the end, right? And he leaves the world, and there was, in both places, there were no room for him. And uh, so take it for what it's worth. There you go. So he stays there not only because there was no place to stay in Jerusalem, but also because he's staying with friends, because Jesus was human, y'all. He still is. He's about to take the plunge for our sins. So the days leading up to that, he's going to be with the people that are clo- he's closest to. Good food, uh, good fellowship before, uh, like I said, he takes it all uh, for our sakes. So on the first Palm Sunday, as this, he starts, he inaugurates this process of the last seven days of his earthly ministry, Jesus uh, sends his disciples to borrow this donkey, uh, one that had never been ridden. You know, ironically, this donkey who had never been ridden, is carrying the man who's about to carry the burdens of the entire world. Isn't that interesting? I just find it interesting. I say one more thing. I, I don't know what the application totally is, but I think, it's, I think it's certainly something worth pondering. Jesus is traveling on the main road that led into the, from the Jordan Valley up over the Mount of Olives, east into Jerusalem. It's the only main road that led directly into the Temple Mount. 
And so, of course, if you read a little bit further there in chapter, chapter 19, he goes straight into the temple and begins to clear the temple. And one, at least one of the situations where he cleared the temple, I think probably he did it twice. But at least one of those situations was right here at the end of his ministry. He clears the temple because he finds them doing the same thing they've been doing before, which is uh, selling things, changing money, turning the house of prayer into a house of money. And so he didn't, he didn't take, take to that too well. So as the sun is rising in the east, by the way, that's east, this is south, and that's north. So that would make that west, right? So as the sun is rising in the east, Jesus is riding toward the west into Jerusalem. The sun is coming up. Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives. He's headed into Jerusalem, and that's the, that's the circumstance of the situation. And so he begins this ride, and his disciples begin to praise him, and the crowd begins to take notice. And had we had a reporter there, if, we, if it was back to Walter Cronkite, and you were there, there would be a reporter that probably would say something like this. Hey, uh, Jeff, here I am, and, and this prophet from Nazareth, Jesus, is coming, and we just heard that he healed two people back in Jericho not just a day or two ago, and then now he's, he's just spent the night at the house of Lazarus. Of course, Lazarus is now well-known in Jerusalem because Jesus raised him, from, raised him from the dead. He's like a household name, and so we're, we're anxious to see what this man, Jesus, is going to do. Of course, the, the Passover season was a festival season, expectations, and so something like this, I mean, how, how did the crowd come together and know that Jesus was doing this? The word spread, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't tweet anything, and there was no Facebook message, and there was no public announcement system, and so even though we're pretty sure there were no reporters there, nonetheless, somebody was getting the word out because this massive crowd, so it starts off as this humble little procession of Jesus riding on this donkey, this humble little Jewish man of no, no appearance that, that mattered uh, so much. But the story of him begins to spread in the season of Passover, the season of expectation. They expect God to do something, because he does on these festivals. And so this man who now is coming with this renown, many of the Jews who from Judea have heard the stories, they've actually seen him do the stuff, the healing and the the miracles and the things, and the others who have traveled from all over the world, they're hearing the same stories and they're all saying the same thing. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the king that the prophets have spoken of, that we've waited for? Could this be the man? And so they begin to worship him and praise him. And like I said, this humble entry into Jerusalem turns out to be effectively a first century version of a ticker tape parade. And they, they lay their coats on the ground and palm branches on the ground because that's the way you welcome the king. So in their hearts, at least temporarily, and it was very temporary, like I said, four days later they're crucifying, same crowd. In their hearts temporarily, they're honoring him as king. They're saying he's not worthy to even step on the ground because he is the king of Jerusalem. And so they're, ho- they're on, on talking out of two sides of their face. He's the king. Is he really the king? He's the king. We sure hope he is. And, of course, when there's doubt in the heart and when the heart doesn't really know what it's talking about, which theirs does, did not, then as soon as he does something that you think he shouldn't do, then they out him. And that's what they did. They were worshiping their version of the king, but they weren't actually worshiping the king for who he was. Because the king for who he was was rising, riding in, hum, in humility, weeping as he went on a donkey that had never been written before. So they welcomed him as a conquering king. And if we had been there, had reporters been there with camera crews, what would they have seen? Well, here's one thing they would have seen. They would have seen who Jesus was and is. They would have seen him for who he really was. They would have seen him up close. They would have said, folks, here we are now, and until now, Jesus has kept himself away from being proclaimed by the crowds. He's not accepted any accolades. He's He's not allowed anyone to proclaim him as king, but something's changed today, guys. I don't know what it is, but he's out in front. He's orchestrated his own ride. The crowds that are praising him, he's not shushing them as he always did before. Policy of Jesus was to always shush people throughout his ministry, was it not? He would not let them claim him as king, even though he was. He would not allow demons who would say, I know who you are, the son of God, right? He wouldn't let them talk. What was he afraid of? Of nothing. Just wasn't his day yet. But this was his day. 
This was his day, the day that we're looking at here. This was his day, but here was his standard policy. So Simon Peter claims him as king, right? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You're correct, my friend. For flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, right? But only my Father in heaven, he goes on to say. And then notice the next thing he says to his disciples. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. So that was his policy for three and a half years of ministry. And then all of a sudden, boom, seven days before his crucifixion, policy completely changes. He orchestrates the ride. He tells the Pharisees, if they be quiet, the stones will cry out. He doesn't shush anybody. He accepts all their accolades. What changed? Like I said, this was a special day. This was an important day that he was going to be recognized as king, albeit with the wrong hearts and the wrong attitudes. But still, he was going to be praised as king. Nowhere did he accept accolades like this, but in this case, he set it up, even directing a, a donkey, right? Just like it promised that, that, the, that the king would do in Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. They were doing that, weren't they? You bet. Wow, so Jesus was fulfilling prophecy, and so were they. That's the way prophecy is. You, either you're going to be you're going to prove right God by going against it, or you're going to prove right God by going with it. And so God's going to be right no matter what. You've got to decide where you're going to land. That's your decision. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, just like Jesus does. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. 700 years before he does it, it's written. How did he do that? How did he put that... But he put that together, I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? He wasn't just, though, listen, it wasn't just this prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled all the prophecies concerning his first coming that came out of the Old Testament. You know how many there were? 456 prophecies. Anybody like to watch the CSI movies or the the crime investigation, uh, true real life things where the people, this person did that or she did that or he did that. And anymore, it seems uh, more than half of them are solved through a thing called DNA, right? It happened 20 years ago, but we have DNA. And now that as science has advanced, they take this DNA and they find out, oh, it's this person. It's him. It's her. And by the way, once they've got the DNA, what have they got? open and shut case because it only fits one person i mean that's the thing about dna is that you have a unique strand that no one else has and no one else will ever have and so it will only be you right well listen jesus hear me fit a very specific dna and 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 i'm not talking about his physical descent from king david even though that was definitely part of it i'm talking about a prophetic dna let's say for the sake of argument that we're doubters. So he's gotten himself a donkey, all right? He could read Zechariah, so can I. I could have done this. I could have found a donkey. I could have got a group of guys together and stirred up a little crowd, and maybe we could have got it going. So, so, so how is this supposed to be? How do we know for sure this is Jesus? This is the speculation in the crowd. How, how can we know? Well, let, me, let me ask you this. So I could orchestrate a donkey ride, but how do you get the whole crowd to praise you? So, well, that was just coincidence. Okay, I'll give you that. But let's add to that coincidence some other things. Let, let's go back. So if you say he orchestrated his ride and he somehow got the people stirred up and there was a brief window in which, a uh, time warp in which there was a uh, tweeter back then and so he got the message out and then the time warp closed and he, he, you know, let's just, I mean, if you want to argue crazy, we can be crazy. But let's go back. Let's, so he, let's say, for instance, we could say it was happenstance that he got this all together. So let me ask you something else about happenstance. How did he arrange for himself to be... So I can understand how he could arrange a donkey. How did he arrange himself to be born in Bethlehem? <coughs> if you want to argue what he arranged, how did he do that? And to a virgin. Unless he's God. If you're not willing to go there, well, then we can consider other happenstances here about his life. And then, then there's the whole deal of his ancestry. I've already said that. I mean, David had a, had a lineage, and he had to be of the lineage of David, but it turns out not only was his mother, Mary, 
his physical, where he fit, received his physical traits from, of the line of David, so was his adopted dad, Joseph. They were both the line of David. How did he do that? How, how did he orchestrate? Unless he's God, then we've got an easy answer. But if you don't think he's God, then you've got yourself a problem. Additionally, uh, what about all those miracles that the prophets prophesied that he would do, and that in fact he did? How did he orchestrate that? Unless he's God. And then, of course, he was betrayed, as according to the prophets, by a close companion predicted both in Psalms and in Zechariah. And not only did they predict it, that he would be betrayed, they also predicted the exact amount of money that was actually spent on him. How do you do that? But as for you, sorry, that's where he was born. That's a good verse too. As for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth from... From, for me to be ruler in Israel, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. How do he do that? So it's one thing to know that that's true about the Messiah, but how do you orchestrate it? And then let's get to the one we were talking about, Zechariah 11. So how do you orchestrate not only being betrayed, but for the exact amount of money that Zechariah wrote about 700 years before? Unless he's God. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages, it says, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. Wait a minute. And the magnificent price for which I, you've, they val I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and I threw it to them, threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. That's exactly what happened in the New Testament. Judas betrays him, feels bad about it, throws the money, gives the money back to the Jews. The Jews don't want it, so he throws it into the temple just like it says. And what did they do with the money? Bought the potters feel with it how did he orchestrate that unless he's god unless he's god and then that he was crucified according to psalm 22 psalm 22 is written about jesus and his crucifixion some 300 years before crucifixion is ever invented as a form of execution how did he do that how did he know that how do you suppose he arranged that, that none of his bones would be broken? Again, Psalm 22, speaking of his crucifixion, a colloquial way of saying that my, my bones are not broken is just what it says there. I can count on my bones. They're all there. They're all right, effectively. They're all whole. How do you arrange that? Because typically, when you were crucified, they broke a lot of bones. Wrist bones, ankle bones, leg bones. And of course, in the case of Jesus' crucifixion, they break the legs of both guys on either side of him. It was pretty standard policy if you wanted mercy for your crucified loved one or friend or whatever, that you would go and pay off the local Roman cohort. And what they would do as a mercy killing is they would break their legs so they wouldn't live more than about 24 hours. Otherwise, they may hang out there for three or four days. And so it was not unusual, as in the case of uh, the Pharisees go to, fa go to, go to um, Pilate and say, can you, can you have their legs broken for us? And they go up there and they break the two guys' legs, so they're still alive. They go to Jesus and they found out that he's dead. In order to prove that he's dead, they run a spear into his side, which, by the way, was prophesied some 900 years before. How did he orchestrate that? That he, one, would not have his bones broken, but he would still be pierced. Man, how did he do that? And then not only that, how do you suppose he arranged that the guards would gamble for his clothing, which is exactly prophesied? And so, unless he's God. Had we been there that day, we would have seen him for who he really is. And who is he really? Well, you're looking at it. These for prophecies will fulfill, continue on to a total of 456 exact properties, property, prophecies, I can say it, predicted seven, more than half a millennium in most cases in advance before he fulfilled them. Familiar with the name? I got a dollar for you if you are. Don't lie. David Greenglass? Any history buffs here? Any atomic energy history buffs here? Two dollars. <laughs> David Greenglass? David Greenglass is important for our, our history, especially the past 60 or so years of existence of the United States, 70 years of United since, since the end of World War II, David Greenglass was the guy who sold atomic secrets to the Soviets at the end of the Second World War. The arms race, the nuclear energy race, all that stuff. 
by and large, we owe it to that guy. He was a traitor. He sold nuclear secrets to the Soviets, and uh, as a result, of course, we were, trying to, we were hunting him down. He fled 18 hours south of here to Mexico City, and he holed up there and contacted the Soviet uh, ambassador's office there and wanted them to give him a, um, a passport and a visa to get him out of the country. Well, they told him he had to do six different things before they would do this for him. They wanted to make sure that he was not a spy, that he was not some other person, that he was actually the guy who had sold them the nuclear secrets. And so they set up a six-dimensional fail-safe, basically, to make sure that he was the guy. The first thing that he had to do is he had to leave Mexico City and come back. When he came back, he had to write a note to the secretary of the ambassador of the so of the the um, of the ambassador to the Soviet Union in Mexico City. And on that letter, it didn't matter what it said in the letter, he had to sign it as I. Period Jackson. So whatever the letter said, it had to be signed that way. And then he had to wait exactly three days, and then he had to go down to the what's called the Plaza de Colón, which is one of the, one of the pl big plazas in the, in the center of Mexico City. He had to stand in front of the statue of Christopher Columbus, which is still there, by the way. Stand in front of the statue of Christopher Columbus. And he had to stand there all day. He had to have in his hand a tourist guide map, and he had to be looking at the map and pointing at things in the map with his middle finger. That's what they required of him. And when someone finally approached him, this is a true story, no, no history buffs here. When, when, they, when he was finally approached, if anyone approached him, whatever question they asked of him, he had to always answer with, isn't this a beautiful statue? No matter what they asked him. Isn't this an awesome statue, Christopher Columbus? And then they would follow, if it was the real person trying to contact him, they would follow with the second question of what state are you from? And he had to say, Oklahoma. Sorry for Oklahomans out here, or Jacksons. The Jacksons from Oklahoma are traitors, don't you know? True story. So six fail-safes so that they would know that this traitor was actually the real guy. It actually worked. They got his passport and his visa, and they got him out of Mexico. So, but they put things, six things together because no one by happenstance or perchance would ever do that. That's how they know that it was going to be him. So it, it worked because that's what you do. Well, let me, let me say this to you. Speaking of fail-safes, Jesus had 456 of them that he fulfilled. So is he the Messiah or isn't he? Is he the king or isn't he? Can anyone else be this? Can anyone else orchestrate this? No, certainly it's not possible. Had they been there, they would have seen him for who he was. And then secondly, and finally, they would have seen him, they would have seen him for what he was. And then secondly, they would have seen him for who he was. It was, he did a very odd thing when he rides into Jerusalem. Do you see what it says there? So we call it the triumphal entry, so why is he crying? Why is he weeping? Had we had a reporter again on the scene, that reporter would have maybe done something like this. Yeah, Jeff, I'm standing here and I'm, I'm on the way, the road leading into Jerusalem, and right behind me right now as I'm speaking to you is, is this guy, this prophet of Nazareth, and they're singing hymns to him and they're claiming him as king, and, and I'm just, wait a minute, wait a minute. I believe he's crying. In fact, he is. I'm not sure what's going on because this seems like the best day of his life and I can't understand why this man who being claimed as king would be crying the way that he is. The, the word here in the Greek for crying isn't just he was shedding a tear, y'all. It wasn't just like, an, yeah, I think, I think I see a tear in his eye over there. I think she's a little upset. No, the word here in the Greek is wailing. He's wailing. How many of you love to cry in public? Men, let me see the men's hands here. <laughs> Just can't wait to humble yourself. Isn't that the problem? Isn't that the problem? And the reason why ladies are able to do it is because they're more emotional than us, right? No, because they're less prideful than us. Gentlemen, let's be honest. We have our pride, right? Jesus didn't. Jesus doesn't. He doesn't just shed a tear. He's wailing. He's weeping. Everyone would have seen it. Not just a few up close, oh, I think he's got a tear in his eye. No. Everyone would have seen it. They would have heard him. 
So here comes the mighty king, by the way, in great humility, and even more humble because he lowers himself in the eyes of all these people by publicly crying. You think it was just tough for men nowadays to cry? Same back then. We were, we were still a bunch of arrogant, hairy people, just gentlemen, just like we back then as much as we are today. So to see a man crying publicly would have been a very unusual thing. Jesus humbles himself. He humbles himself. Why does he cry like this? Because he knows what's coming, as he says. Because you didn't recognize me this day, 483 years to the day in advance predicted, and you weren't waiting for me with your hearts correct. So you're not going to get a second chance. And, and very interestingly enough and very different from me if it had been me. He doesn't gloat. He doesn't smirk. He doesn't say, well, too bad for y'all. You know what? Because I'm going on with the plan of God here. No, he doesn't do that. He weeps. Judgment was going to fall on the Jews 37 years later. It was going to happen just exactly like Jesus had predicted here. Interesting, though, and instructive is that he wails. He doesn't say, I told you so. He doesn't have a smirk of, oh, well, you're going to get what's coming to you. No, he weeps. He wails. He's the king, but he's the king that is, listen, moved by our problems. Even when our problems are due to our own willful disobedience, which was true for all these people. Willfully knowing the scriptures taught that they should have been waiting for him. They weren't there. Not in true heart anyway. Even in willful disobedience, he weeps for what was going to happen to us. Yeah, you want to talk about the real God of the Bible? That's the real God of the Bible. That's the real God. That's the God we worship. That's who he really is. The king who is moved by our problems, even the problems that we cause, Isaiah 63, 9, right? In, our, in their afflictions, he was afflicted. Because he let himself be. Because that's who he is. That's who he really is. That's who he really is. God doesn't just, listen, know our sorrows. He can taste them. He makes himself vulnerable, right? He allows himself to be moved by our, by our lives. Our, our, our actions and attitudes affect God. That should blow you away. God allows himself to be affected by a nothing like me? Yes. Very much so. So when we disobey him, we aren't just breaking rules. Yeah, we're breaking his heart. We're breaking his heart. And he, even though there may not be a second chance, he's not necessarily happy for it. Had, had we been there that day, we would have seen the king who would rather die than live without us. I want to ask you please to bow your heads and close your eyes as we think about the things that God has taught us the triumphal entry of Christ? No, it was not. It was sad. It was mournful. It was misunderstood. It was taken wrong and intended wrong. But he was carrying out a contract that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit had established from all eternity. Taking our place knowing what we would do, seeing our hurt, feeling our massive mistakes, our huge problems that we bring upon ourselves because of our disobedience, because we won't listen. He takes that. He feels it. That's the real God of the Bible. That's the real Jesus that we worship. That's the real one who we can't say anything other than he really cares for us. He really loves us. I pray today as we study the entrance of the king that we would allow him to be king over us. Lord God, we do ask that. We ask God that you would change us, mold us, move us, so that you can really be king in our lives. So you can really reign as king so that, so that when we worship, we're worshiping the right Jesus, the right God. Not a God that we form, not a God that, you want us to, that we want you to be. 
but the God who you've always said that you were and that you are. God, I thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you for being a king that weeps for us. Lord, I pray today, if nothing else, we would run to the refuge of the one whose heart breaks for us. We need that, Lord. We need you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.